University. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Information and Communication Studies there. And um, I want to talk about, um, actually, originally was going to talk just about the Bukas Lab, which is a learning laboratory of sorts that we have at, the, at my university. But um, after today's really interesting workshop, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I got to um, building this lab that I did. Um, and later on, I will be um, asking everyone to participate in a short uh, survey. So I'm just putting this um, QR code and this URL down here, um, which we'll be referring to later. And hopefully I don't go over time. Um, I will flash this out again, so I will move on. Um, so it, it was interesting, after going through the workshops today, I remembered that I had been doing work in um, hybrid reality spaces for quite some time now. Um, so this is um, the lab that I was working in back in 2002. And back then, what we were doing was um, projecting um, this board game onto a tabletop and you have these physical pieces that you would move and based on where the pieces were on the board um, the gameplay um, would change here because back then we were thinking about how you know we wanted to leverage the the the, the strengths of face-to-face -face, uh, gameplay um, so there's lots of um, nonverbal uh, cues that you can work with. Um, all these fun things are kind of grouping together physically, but also the ability of digital spaces to capture complex um, um, states. Um, and we were using Palm Pilots back then because that was the, the cool technology back then. And so this was back in 2002. And I haven't been doing a lot of work in, in gameplay um, since then, but this is still one of... Uh, well, I wasn't the, co the, the lead author here, but this is still the paper um, that I co-wrote that it still gets most cited. Um, but my background is really in computer science and dance and contemporary dance. And as a dancer, one of the things that I came to appreciate was learning about my own body, um, body awareness, um, and this field of study called somatics, which is the um, study of, the, of your own body from within a phenomenological view of of one's own physicality. Um, I trained in something called the Feldenkrais method um, for, a, for a, quite a while. And it's a very slow, very gentle movement practice that is about trying to build um, awareness of your own body. Um, and I found this such a, a beautiful, uh, fantastic, useful um, method. Um, I also came across um, the works of, uh, here is Sally Dean. She is a costumer, and she built these amazing costumes. She called them somatic costumes, and um, this is me right here. And the idea is that these costumes would create a totally different perception of your own body. So this is a bunch of balloons that's been stuffed into a nylon stocking, and then you wear these um, bicycle inner tubes around under your groin and over your shoulders. And when I was playing with these costumes, I felt like I was an animal. I felt like it was a salamander and this little bouncy uh, tail over here really felt like a tail. And these were all dancers kind of playing around with these costumes. And when you take off these costumes after 30 minutes of playing with them, I still felt like I was in a different body. I didn't feel quite human. And I was thinking to myself, is it possible um, to create um, a technology, a, a tool, a device that can have allow more people to experience this kind of um, experiences. And so this was my PhD. I developed this wearable technology made out of 14 motors that you wear on your back and then you program um, using this. So it's kind of like vibro-tactile music for your skin. Um, and I, borrowing um, from the fields of psychology, I created a series of workshops where I got people to try them on. I didn't tell them what it was about. And it looks like the device did what I wanted it to do, which was to make people more aware of those parts of their body that was being vibrated by applying increasingly complex, sophisticated patterns of vibration. Um, I don't have time to really go into um, what these drawings mean other than to show you how people perceive their body before wearing this device and then what happens when only one side of their body got vibrated. Um, and you see this across all of the different drawings that people became more aware of their body when we play these pleasurable um, vibrating um, motor patterns on their body. 
Um, we then adapted these kinds of technologies in other ways. So here we are. This was a three-day hackathon I did in Amsterdam. And so I was working with um, a composer, um, a sculptor, a speculative designer, a computational neuroscientist, and a fashion designer, and a, communica a science communicator. And what we did was we took this vibrating technology that I had done for my PhD, we put it in the silicone cast, and then we attached it um, to to um, a machine learning model um, that would read your brain waves. So this model here is wearing a portable EEG sensor. And the idea is that you could sense what emotional state, affective state the user is in. And then if you wanted to calm them or make them more excited, you would apply different kinds of sounds or vibrations. So she's wearing some headphones here. And the idea is that, oh, are you not calm enough? Let's try a different combination of patterns or a co different combination of sounds. Um, and so we put this very t quickly together in a span of two or three days. Um, and then we kind of continued this work for a little bit. Um, so with the work that I had, was doing before, we were using these technologies to make people more aware of their bodies by often, um, so often we feel like our body parts are not quite connected. There's my head, there's my neck, there's my, but it's not like one big entire thing. And the, the kinds of technologies that we were developing was meant to um, create this more unified sensation of the body. But it turned out that it can also do weird things like make you feel like you had arms that were really, really long. And so we built a different immersive environment. This time we took that same idea of vibrating your body, but it was your entire body. So underneath this model are 200 vibrating motors um, over there that you can see that. And then you're surrounded in this wall of sound and it feels like you're in this science fiction cocoon of that, like it was like um, you were being transformed and that was the idea. Um, and, um, and at the end, we asked people to do the same thing which was as, as the other, other experiments which is to show us how, their how they perceive their bodies before and after. And so we would take this neutral image and then ask them to sculpt it kind of using their fingers. And so here's some before and after images. So before getting into the capsule, we called it the, the Remy capsule. Remy standing for reimagine myself or um, I can't remember what the other, but it's, it's like reimagining the body. And so before they felt like um, like this, like they, they felt a bit tilted towards the right, and then afterwards they came out feeling a bit more balanced. This one, I have no idea what was going on, but it was very interesting. <laughs> I, before they felt like that enormous um, legs, and now they felt like their legs were nothing. I mean, it wasn't very predictable what would happen, but this idea of using immersive um, non-visual, which is the other interesting thing, immersive non-visual sensory technologies to reshape bodily self-image. This is what we were after. Um, and interestingly, we've, I think there's, this has some application for sensory motor rehabilitation for health purposes. And so this is a prototype that one of my undergraduate students had built um, using lights to cue someone when they should be feeling a vibration so if you had a stroke and you've lost some sensation, the idea is that maybe a glove like this can help with that. And I actually, I haven't continued this line of research, but I would like to. Um, so that's really just about um, some recent work that I've, or the history of work that I've done that's led up to now. And this is where I teach now. This is the University of the Philippines Open University. This is our campus, it's beautiful. And all of our courses at the Open University are virtual. Um, and we, our students are from all over the world, mostly from Asia, but quite a lot as well from North America, Europe. Um, we have one student in South Africa, apparently. That's good to know. Um, so it's all distributed. So the question is, why would I or anyone at the university build a physical learning lab? Because everything that you've seen, everything that I've told you about my work, I needed to have a physical lab to do that in. So. We do have learning labs at the university. And at this point, this is when I'd like you to take out your phones or um, type this URL into, um, into your uh, laptops. And I'm going to see whether this works. Ah, maybe you won't. I wonder if I can, oh, yeah, it works. 
All right. So these two spaces are actual spaces that exist at our university. And so um, I'm curious if you were to go somewhere to study, which space you, um, would you pick? I'll wait a few more minutes, a few more seconds. I'll just talk over this. Um, so yeah, these are both spaces. I won't tell you which one um, is which. Okay. So I'm going to just advance the poll to the next one now, to the next question. So I'm I'm curious. So I'm I'm genuinely curious. If you were going to go to work in space B instead of space A, when might you do it? I'll wait like maybe five seconds or um, so this space, there's fluorescent lighting and then there are these desks and there are these people there to work alone when you really need to focus, when you need to enter a, a non-interactive seminar. Okay, I'm going to move this along just in the interest of time. And when might you choose to go work in space A instead? So there's lots of wooden detailing and there's these weird kind of, I don't know what these are, like capsules with some plants. When you want to do something creative to focus and spend a long time, they're great. Okay, so I'm just going to move this along and go back to my presentation. Right, so this was the existing um, learning space that we had at our university. Um, it had been around for 15 years, 20 years, something along those lines. Um, more, um, and these kind of reflected um, the way we thought a learning laboratory um, would, um, would look, should function. So it was still important, we found out, for students who were virtually participating at the university to still have a physical place to come together. Um, but then about 12 years ago, um, we invited this artist, his name is Angelo Vermeulen, um, to, to do um, a six month long project with us to build a new media art installation, um, which was this. So working with our students, we, we totally dropped the pure online only mode and we built this sculpture together. So what you see here is a 10 foot case, 10 foot high case made out of recycled coconut lumber inside are old computers that have been made to run again, and some of them are being cooled using living algae. So this algae is being pumped into the computers um, in order to cool them. The algae becomes too hot, so we cool the algae using um, fish tanks that are inside. Oh, I'm, I'm 13 minutes in, so I'm going to stop this. So, so, um, and so all of this is actually also serving as a kind of greenhouse for the plants that are growing inside. And so we've been doing this kind of work of reimagining what technology, biology um, might look like um, in many places around the world. And then the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, everyone went online at the university. So we've always been teaching online at the Open University but suddenly even the teachers had to function um, completely online. And then we realized humans are made out of flesh and bone and we're materials and we need physical spaces to work in. And so over the course of the next um, three months during, or over the course of the year during the pandemic, um, I started to prepare building a space where students and faculty could get together and co-create in the way that we had co-created um, that installation that we had done before. And so this is one of our existing laboratories. And then over time, I transformed it into the Bukas Lab. So Bukas in, the, in Filipino stands for both tomorrow and open. And so the idea is, is this open lab um, where um, students can come in along with faculty, experiment and prototype. Um, and we've, even though we are a completely um, virtual university, we've um, started offering um, some courses, at least one course, that tries to make use of this lab. So I'm going to close by talking about one example activity that we've done in this lab. This is the Wearable Futures Hackathon, um, and over 12 
the course of 12 weeks, what we did was get students to learn about futures thinking, forecasting, speculative design, and wearable technology design. And so for the first time um, in a long time, we've had students physically come into our physical spaces um, and learn in this kind of um, hybrid manner. So I think we met in total of four times over the course of 12 weeks. Um, so, and you can see the kinds of topics that we covered. Uh, we talked a little about, about um, futures thinking, um, deep time thinking, speculative um, design. Um, and then students worked on a combination of um, theoretical work and then practical work. So here they learned how to program with a microbit, which is a microcomputer. And at the end of the 12 weeks, the students came up with some of the most interesting projects, some of them I totally didn't expect. So one student came up with a suit um, that would generate electricity as you walked. And the idea is that why do we waste all of our energy working at the gym and then not capturing that energy? Um, and he imagines that 50 years into the future, this is what all gyms are going to be. No energy is wasted. Um, this student, I was very concerned about how farmers, um, how farmers can incorporate technology into their, into their work. So this is a glove that in the future can sense pH and soil moisture even as you're tilling the ground. And what I love about this project is how really close to the body and how she really thought about um, you know, how it might be possible to engage um, different kinds of people in wearable tech. Um, um, this is probably one of the most interesting ones produced by, uh, by a group. This is a set of underwear and a belt um, that if it's tugged forcefully and without consent, it sends an alarm. Um, and it alarms other people in the area. It sends an emergency message to your contacts. Um, so it's, it's basically an anti-rape, anti-sexual harassment device. Um, and so what's common? Uh, oh yeah, this one is really interesting too. This is, a, this is a watch and also something that's imprinted into your skin that tells everyone what your carbon footprint is. And so that your carbon footprint becomes a measure of your social acceptability. So I think what was interesting and unpredictable for uh, what I didn't quite expect was how the students were so passionately, um, obviously political in the, um, in the way they thought about the future and technology. And so, moving forward with the Bukas Lab, this is what I'd like to explore a bit more, understand a bit more, the intersection of politics, social change, um, and technology, especially in the context of the Global South. Thanks very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.